The VN plate camera I trained with had no marked shutter speeds. ISO was called ASA, and you could have any speed plate you wanted, so long as it was 400. It did have f-stops from f45 to f32 mark, though. Luxury. When I were a lad, lenses never even had glass in them. We used to scratch the image onto plate with a rusty nail. Times have changed, and whereas I had to learn the theory and practice behind the exposure, today you can set the camera on P and just press the shutter and get it right. I don't think you should all the time, though, and the fact that you're watching this video means you don't either. To start, we need to note that correct exposure has two possible interpretations. Firstly, accurate in the sense of technically correct, and secondly, right in the sense of artistically correct for the image you wish to present. That's far and away the most interesting aspect, and the one I'll talk about later. But first, technically, every sensor has a native sensitivity, one at which it gives its best results, that is to say, lowest noise and widest range of tones. It is usually around ISO 200, and any change from that will either increase its noise or narrow its tonal range or both. Whether you will see these differences in practice will depend on how far you stray from the native ISO, and to some extent on the nature of your subject. Whatever ISO you select, the sensor will require a measured dose of light for that setting to perform at its best. Too much, and your shot is too light. Too little, and it's too dark. It used to be a problem to ascertain the optimum exposure, but modern camera metering has more or less eliminated the complexity of it. Even under extreme conditions like this, where with film I would have agonised over exposure, the camera comes up with a great compromise. And especially if you shoot raw, the compromise exposure gives you the best basis for making corrections in post-processing. There are three metering methods offered on Micro Four Thirds cameras. First, Olympus's pattern system, similar to Panasonic's multi-metering, which are full-screen intelligent metering systems. I'll call them generically matrix metering from now on. Secondly, centre-weighted, and thirdly, spot. Centre-weighted metering is a leftover from pre-digital days, and modern matrix metering does everything it does but better, so realistically it comes down to matrix or spot. The makers don't tell us the exact methods of their intelligence matrix metering, but it certainly takes into account the positioning and relative brightness of image elements on the screen, and can work out that a light source in frame should be played down in the calculations, for example. If you are using face recognition focusing, I would imagine it would weight the exposure towards the face area, as another example. I find I use matrix metering almost exclusively, though I often dial an exposure compensation on occasions where experience tells me the result will be better. Spot metering can be useful, but needs to be used carefully. Of course, no metering method can change the performance of a sensor, so they all do the same thing in the end, which is to find an exposure that makes the most of the sensor's capability. For a given scene, matrix or spot readings, used properly, will give the same reading. Spot is simply a way of restricting your reading to what you consider the most important element of an image. Here's the science, as they used to say in the hair shampoo ads. The basis of all photographic metering is the assumption that the overall brightness of any scene, if averaged, will amount to a mid-tone. In RGB terms, that is 127, 127, 127. In this landscape, we have a complex mixture of tones, but they do average out to a mid-tone, witness the same scene at differing exposures. Where they don't, like this mainly dark tone shot, or this mainly light toned one, matrix metering will apply its intelligence to them, and will pick up if the scene is not typical. So, if you photograph someone in a dark blue jacket on a skating rink, matrix metering will not expose for the eyes, but will take into account what it identifies as the subject, and other tone masses, and weight the exposure accordingly. It may not, probably won't get a 100% satisfactory exposure, but it will usually be well within correctable limits. But spot metering has only a tiny area to calculate from, and pointed at the same icy scene may meter entirely from the dark jacket, which, rendered as a mid-tone, will be overexposed, burning out the ice. Conversely, if the spot area is ice, that will be rendered as a mid-grey, underexposing and losing the crisp whites of the scene, while making the blue jacket too dark. In the scenario here, the best course of action would be matrix metering, 
with a half or a full stop of plus compensation applied to your taste. In other words, spot metering can be very useful where a subject is in difficult light, but unless used intelligently can be less accurate and harder to interpret than a full screen reading. So, we have established that your camera's meter is usually best used in its matrix mode, and that it will rarely produce a reading that makes a picture irretrievable. If you shoot RAW, you will have enough exposure correction in hand to tweak the exposure to your satisfaction in post-processing. If you shoot JPEG, which discards much of the raw image information in camera, setting bracketing to normal, plus one and minus one stop will cover most eventualities. I don't mean to dismiss spot metering. It has its uses where there is a massive difference in brightness between your subject and its background. This crow against the deep blue sky, for example. Your spot meter will happily meter for the crow, provided you keep the metering area on the bird. Unfortunately, as it must, it will try to render the crow's black mid-tone so that you could lose the richness of the blue sky while making the crow an insipid copy of its original inky self. If your subject reflectance is close to a mid-tone, a spot meter reading is very useful. But if it isn't, you have to apply compensation, either at the time of shooting or in post-processing. In this case, I've matrix metered and exposed at 1 1600th at f4, but applied half a stop plus compensation to maintain detail in the black feathers. With a spot reading from the inky blackbird, I get 1 600th at f4, but need to apply a stop minus compensation to keep the feathers black. Exposure-wise, that's roughly the same either way, as it should be. For bird shots like these, I personally would take the matrix reading in manual mode and then open up a half or full stop. Different coloured birds and different skies and light will need different compensation, or none at all, but no meter can be relied on to be exact under flying bird conditions and you will need to build up some experience to get the best results. I said I'd use manual exposure. That way, as the bird flies past light and dark backgrounds, the sky or trees, your roughly correct exposure for the bird will not be changed as the meter interprets the changing background as the bird comes into land, crossing a background of sky, trees and maybe even water. I should mention that Olympus also has spot metering highlight and spot metering shadow on some of their cameras. The same caveat applies to these as a normal spot reading. If used clumsily, they can produce unanticipated results, like these examples. Here I've used spot highlight and metered from shadow. Here I've used spot shadow and metered from a highlight. I'm not suggesting you'd be that dumb, but it illustrates the pitfalls. If a truly inaccessible subject really requires spot metering, I'd suggest using the standard spot meter and applying a half or a stop plus or minus compensation if the target is darker or lighter than a mid-tone respectively. There's one other form of metering I should mention, which is an incident light reading. This is probably the most reliable form of light metering there is, but unlike matrix metering, experience must be applied to it. An incident reading measures not the light reflected from the subject into your camera, but the light directly falling on your subject. And the classic way is to use a handheld light meter with an incident attachment fitted and hold the meter next to your subject, pointing to the camera. I say that this is the most reliable method, incident, because it measures directly without interpretation or restriction. It is measuring the raw light, in other words. However, you must judge for yourself the reflectance of your subject and how much to open up or close down to compensate. Plus, if your subject is half in and half out of shadow, which of those to expose for? In truth, matrix metering is doing much the same thing for you, and makes handheld metering redundant except in rare cases, such as flashlight in the studio. Matrix metering plus bracketing will cover most eventualities, but you can't fire off three or five shots of every subject, moving ones for example. So, to sum up, matrix metering rules, and matrix metering plus applied experience rules almost absolutely making the need for any other method occasional, even more so if you shoot raw. That's not to dismiss spot metering though, because in conditions like this, it enables you to choose exactly which area you wish to expose, rather than have matrix impose its compromise exposure on you. And if you wanted face detail in a shot like this, spot would be the only way. That's the technical aspect of the correct exposure. Couple of points here. If you find your camera consistently over or underexposes for your taste, you can set an overall plus or minus to correct it. 
For myself, I've never come across such a consistent error, and I correct as and when necessary. Secondly, if you want to get a hands-on feel for the effects of exposure, set your camera to manual, and with Panasonic, set constant preview to on. On Olympus, set live view boost off. Now, what about the right exposure aspect? The right exposure is more interesting because it is more personal. After all, photography is about pictures. Imagine telling Rembrandt that the mill was too dark and lacked detail in the shadows. Underexposure is one of my favourite tools, but occasionally I see something I feel is suited to overexposing. I particularly like underexposure combined with very high ISO. The dark tones and noise add atmosphere. When I was working for people with creative minds like Paul and Linda McCartney, I used to sometimes push Fujichrome 200 to 3200 just for the grain and atmosphere it gave. You do need artistically aware clients to pull that one off though. I like harsh sunlight too, because exposing for the extremes tends to abstract or simplify things, a bit like monochrome photography does. And the underexposure here serves to bring out the car headlamps and emphasise the bulk of the mountain. I'll finish with some pics of a silk rose at various exposures. The rose is appealing in itself, but it is fascinating how different exposures change the texture and impression of it. The point here is that there is no right or wrong. Within certain bounds, there's probably no accurate or inaccurate either. When I was a press photographer in London working with guys from other papers and agencies at a photo call, someone would often go up to the subject position and make an official light reading, as we'd laughingly call it. Then someone would say, that doesn't sound right, and take their own reading. These were guys using the most sophisticated handheld meters around. Not only did different makes of meter get different readings, I and several others had Minolta meters, very expensive high-end stuff. We could stand side by side and get different readings spanning maybe a stop. Since these were the finest light measuring devices available, you could sensibly ask yourself, then what is the correct exposure? Ultimately, the only answer possible, it's the one you like best. Thanks for watching.